Well, this weekend we're continuing our series uh, called Trusting God in the Midst of, of Change, uh, the moving message of the minor prophets, and, and we're turning our attention this week to the prophet Nam. Now, one of the things that the Bible teaches in the New Testament about, um, about Scripture is this. It, it says in, in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is God-breathed. It's also translated all Scripture is inspired and it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And, and while 2 Timothy 3.16 uh, does teach that, the book of Nam uh, might make you wonder because it can be a pretty challenging and uncomfortable read. Uh, for one, one reason, I think, is because in the New Testament, Jesus teaches that we should love our enemies. But in the book of Nam, Nam not only announces, but he uh, actually celebrates the destruction of Israel's uh, enemies, uh, Nineveh, and the, the destruction of, of the Assyrian Empire. Uh, by the way, Nam is a, a great writer, a wonderful uh, poet. It's very, very um, vivid language and, and so on. Uh, it's well written, but it's unpleasant. It's about the destruction of, of a city. Now, people have described Nam variously as, uh, and I'm pulling out different quotations from different various commentators and so on. They've described Nam as vengeful and nationalistic, as ethically and theologically deficient, as narrow minded. One commentator actually called him a disgrace, and another says that Nam is an unwelcome part of Scripture. In churches that follow the lectionary, you may or may not be familiar with the concept of a lectionary, but in many churches, uh, there is a three-year cycle of readings. It includes a reading from the Old Testament, reading from the New Testament, and then uh, from the Gospels, and then another reading from the New Testament, often uh, from one of Paul's letters or, or whatever. And in this way, by, if you follow this series of lectionary readings, the idea is that you'll be exposed pretty much to the totality of Scripture. Um, that's uh, almost true, except the lectionary completely omits the book of Nam completely overlooked and, and neglected. So, why was this book then considered important enough to be included in the canon of Scripture? Why is it in the Bible? And is it true that it is God-breathed and useful for teaching and, and all of this other kind of stuff? And, by the way, how does it square with the teaching of Jesus that says we are to uh, love our enemies and, and so on? I was, uh, Peg and I went for a walk last uh, week and I was telling, I think it was on Monday um, evening, and, and I was telling her about you know, what people say about the book of Nam and how uh, problematic it is and so on, and, and her comment was, oh, that's like waving a red flag in front of you. And I knew exactly what she meant because I, I love looking at really tough texts in the Bible and uh, spending time with them to try to discover what uh, God is saying in them and how God can use them to, to teach us to do precisely uh, what he says he does in, in 2 Timothy um, 3.16. And as a matter of fact, Peg reminded me of, uh, of a joke um, the, it turns out to be it was Ronald Reagan's favorite joke. He repeated it so many times that... Um, people in his cabinet actually started repeating it to him. Um, it, it, it's a story about these uh, two twin boys who had very, uh, they were like six years old and they, they were starting to develop into these totally opposite personality types. One of them was a complete pessimist and the other was like this over-the-top optimist kid. And so concerned about this, um, you know, worried that the one kid was just going to be burdened because he was pessimistic all the time, and the other kid was going to be naive because he was so optimistic, their parents took him to a child psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist met with each one of them separately, first met with the, the little pessimist kid, and he, he trying to brighten his eye, outlook and just to see how he responded to things, he took him into this room that was filled with all these wonderful uh, toys. Uh, instead of being happy about it, though, this little kid walks into the room and bursts into tears. And the psychiatrist says, well, you know, what's the matter? Don't you want to play with these toys? And the little kid says, sure I do. But if I did, I'd probably just break them and I'd disappoint my parents. We'd have to pay for them and it, 
all this. And then the psychiatrist meets with, with his optimistic little six-year-old brother and trying to kind of dampen his mood and also get a take on, you know, well, how optimistic is this kid? He takes him into a room that is, is filled with horse manure. And instead of being disgusted by it, the little boy is just totally thrilled. And, and he climbs onto the pile of, of horse manure and he begins scooping it out with his bare hands. And the psychiatrist says, what are you doing? And this little kid goes, man, with all this horse manure, there's got to be a pony somewhere. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that the book of Nam is horse manure by any um, stretch of the imagination. Um, but that's kind of my approach to Scripture, you know, when other people sort of look at it and say, oh, there's nothing here, or this is really negative or whatever. I, I'm sort of like, no, there's a pony in here somewhere. And that's what, what I hope uh, we'll be able to see uh, today as we, we go through this message. Now, we know very little, actually, about Nam as a person. The word Nam means comfort or comforter. Uh, it's related to the, the name Nehemiah. In the Hebrew language, by the way, almost all words are formed with three consonants, and uh, so Nam is, uh, would be our N, H, and M. Nehemiah has N, H, M at the root too. It's just, it's got uh, Nam, Yah, which is the comfort of God, Yahweh, uh, whatever. Um, his name means uh, comfort or comforter. He, we know that he came from a town called Elkosh, but we don't really know where Elkosh is. Uh, most people put it in Judah somewhere, although others have suggested that, well, maybe Capernaum, you know, where Jesus was in the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee and so on. Uh, that could have been the village of Nam. That's probably a long shot, but, we, you know, we, we know his name and we know uh, his hometown, but we don't even know where the hometown was. Um, and the book doesn't actually come out and give us a date of his ministry, although uh, if you just do a little tiny bit of detective work, it's pretty easy to figure out when and where he delivered his, his message. Um, and, and putting together the pieces, we realize that he delivered his prophecies in the late late 7th century B.C. This would be the 600s. Now, how do we know that? Well, we know that because he refers to the, the fall of the Egyptian city of Thebes, which was destroyed by the Assyrians in 663 BC. He describes the fall of Thebes as a past event. So we know that it had to be after 663 BC. And then he also describes uh, the destruction of the Assyrian capital of Nineveh, which was destroyed by the Babylonians in 612 BC as a future event. So that means that we can reasonably put in between 663 uh, BC and 612. BC. And now what that means, this is important, is that Nam's prophecies were actually delivered after the northern kingdom of Israel had been conquered and destroyed by the Assyrians. You know, it was some while ago. Uh, and we also know that during this period of time that the Assyrians were at the absolute height of their power. Now, one of the ways to think about the book of Nam, and I think this is a helpful kind of rule of thumb, is you read through the book of Nam, and by the way, there are only three chapters in the book of Nam, and you can read the whole thing out loud in eight minutes if you wanted to. So one of the things I want to do is encourage you to just go home, read the book of Nam today, and uh, think about what we're learning in, in today's message. As you read through the book of Nam, you might think of him as the prophet Jonah wished he could have been. Now, why do I say that? Because both of them delivered prophecies that predicted God's judgment and destruction of Nineveh. But there's one major difference between Jonah and Nam, and this is why Nam is the prophet Jonah wished that he could have been. They could have been. After Jonah's prophecy, Nineveh repented and was spared. By the time of Nam, Nineveh had absolutely no interest whatsoever in repentance. You know, that, that was a thing of the past. By this time, Assyria had become a monstrously evil, uh, totally unrepentant, and by all appearances, a completely uncontainable imperium that cruelly crushed absolutely anyone or anything that got in its path. 
when we were studying the book of Jonah together a few weeks ago, one of the things you might remember is that uh, according to a military history website that I, I visited, uh, they made a very compelling argument that uh, Assyria uh, was, uh, ought to be thought of as the second most evil uh, empire that has ever existed in the history of the world. Uh, the only one to, to kind of uh, go beyond it in terms of evil uh, was Nazi Germany, the Third Reich, and that only because the, the technology of death was, uh, uh, was so much greater. The thing that we need to, to understand is that the book of Nam will not make any sense to us as Christians who've been taught by Jesus Christ to love our enemies, the book of Nam will not make any sense without a, an awareness of the absolute uh, full extent of Assyrian evil. It's only in that context of Assyrian evil that we can understand verses like, this is Nam, chapter 1 verse 2, the Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. Now, read in today's context, uh, and by the way, read out of context, you look at a text like this and, and you, it's so politically incorrect. It's so theologically incorrect for where most people are today. We talk about the God of, of love and so on. And it's texts like this that lead some people to conclude that the God of the Old Testament is just uh, completely different from the God uh, that we find in the, in the New Testament. This, by the way, is the cover story of Christianity today. It hasn't even come out yet. I have the e-version of it. But the cover story for Christianity today this month is about uh, how God seems to be presented in different ways in the Old and New Testament. So I'm looking forward to that. So the Lord takes vengeance on his foes and, and vents his wrath against his, his enemy. Uh, you read that and it just sounds so harsh and it sounds so unlike the God whom we have come to know in Jesus Christ. But read in the context of uh, over a century, over a century of vicious, Assyrian cruelty and control. We can see how Nam's prophecy would have really sounded like good news. Uh, it, it would be something like, you know, Christians living uh, in France, uh, Nazi-occupied France during the Second World War, listening on these little crystal wireless sets that were illegal and were their only uh, source for objective news from the outside world, and hearing about uh, the carpet bombing of uh, some, you know, Nazi... Um, military unit or whatever. And, and, you know, even though they're people of faith and stuff, you just, in a sense, have to thank God. Now, the key to understanding Nam is really the opening hymn. Uh, and the opening hymn is found in Nam chapter 1, verses 2 through 11. I'm, I'm, I'll read a, a portion of that to you. Um, it begins this, this way, message concerning Nineveh came as a vision to Nam who lived in Elkosh. The Lord is a jealous God filled with vengeance and wrath. He takes revenge on all those who oppose him and continues to rage against his enemies. The Lord is slow to get angry, but his power is great and he never lets the guilty go unpunished. He displays his power in the whirlwind and the storm. The billowing clouds are the dust beneath his feet. At his command, the oceans dry up and the rivers disappear. The lush pastures of Bashan and Carmel fade and the green forests of Lebanon wither. In his presence, the mountains quake and the hills melt away. The earth trembles and its people are destroyed. Who can stand before his fierce anger? Who can survive his burning fury? His rage blazes forth like fire and the mountains crumble to dust in his presence. I'll check this out. The Lord is good. A strong refuge when trouble comes. He is close to those who trust him, but he will sweep away his enemies. 
in an overwhelming flood, he will pursue his foes into the darkness of night. Now, what, what can we learn from, from that? Well, there are a number of things. One that I want to, to focus especially on this morning. In the, it, one of the things that this opening hymn does is describes the Lord as sovereign, is in control, is ruling and reigning over all of creation. Now, in, in the ancient Near Eastern world, other gods in other cultures outside of, of Israel and Judah, other gods were viewed as tribal or as territorial or as national. Nam, like Jonah, who preached against Nineveh before him, like Obadiah, um, whom Pastor Cynthia was talking about how uh, he had uh, his prophecy against this neighborhood bully of, uh, of Edom. Nam, like Jonah and Obadiah before him, acted out of this awareness that the Lord God rules and reigns over all creation, which means that the Lord God rules and reigns over all people, over all nations, over all cultures, everywhere without exception. Not just a tribal God or a regional God or a national God, but a God who rules over all. And it's at this point then that Nam challenges at least one of, of our cherished assumptions. Nam makes it clear that as creator and as Lord over all of creation, God has every right to judge the evil that has marred his creation and that hurts or harms or destroys his children. God has every right to judge the evil that disfigures creation and that hurts people. In, in fact, not to challenge that evil, not to judge it, not to correct it, would itself be evil. Um, someone said that this quote's actually attributed to um, Edmund uh, Burke, uh, that the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. It's a really thoughtful uh, quote. The only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. And that's true for people, uh, even more so with God. God will not allow evil to triumph by just kind of standing back and doing nothing about it. When Nam announces that the Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies, when he says that the, the wicked will uh, not go unpunished and so on, he is, and this seems counterintuitive to us because of the ways in which we've kind of dumbed down the, who God is and skipped over entire passages of Scripture that make us feel uncomfortable. When Nam announces that the Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies, he is actually making a point and a statement about the goodness of God. And here's how it works. There comes a point at which... God, whom Nam tells us, is good. God, who is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. There comes a point when evil is ratcheted up so much that God, in his love for his creation and for his people, has to step in and say, enough is enough. Enough is enough. This cannot stand. So the point is this, that when God unleashes his wrath, and boy, how comfortable do we feel with that word related to God. But when God unleashes his wrath against sin, it is not in spite of his goodness. It is precisely because of his goodness. God has every right to judge the evil that has marred and disfigured his creation and that threatens, hurts, or harms his children. Now, this is basically about judgment. 
In this case, it's judgment against Nineveh. But Nim's announcement of God's judgment is is really important. And these kinds of texts, I think, are important to us, as uncomfortable as they make us feel, because, uh, because without a deep understanding of judgment, salvation is meaningless. Without an understanding of judgment, salvation is meaningless. See, this is what made these uh, really old school sermons like uh, Jonathan uh, Edwards' justly famous Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God so memorable. Uh, Edwards uh, delivered this, this message, Enfield, uh, yeah, Enfield, Connecticut, July 8th, uh, 1741. Uh, and the picture that, that Edwards portrays, what he's talking about is God's right to judge sin and, and evil and the wrath of God against uh, everything that is opposed to, that destroys, that undermines uh, his creation or hurts or harms his people. God's, uh, God's wrath against evil is, is so great that uh, Edwards pictures it in really vivid ways uh, the flames of hell and, and just how angry God is about sin and so on. This message was so powerful. Yeah, it's old school. It wouldn't fly now, but uh, this message was so powerful, and he was able to speak about God's judgment and wrath in such a compelling way that during the course of the message, people actually interrupted him to say, what can we do to be saved? What can we do to be saved? Can you imagine, you know, people being so concerned about judgment in, uh, in today's context that they would actually interrupt uh, somebody to say, what, what can I do to be saved? You know, salvation, uh, they understood the judgment of God, and, and salvation mattered to them uh, because they understood. They understood in a way that, that many of us don't, and I think because we don't read the Bible, frankly. Um, they understood the righteous wrath of God against sin. And, and that kind of preaching, you know, it, yeah, it, it seems over the top today. But you know what? Ignoring the reality of sin and the righteous wrath of God against it has really come at a steep cost for us. I mean, we, we feel like we're so much more enlightened now and, and this kind of stuff. Uh, but I'll tell you the steep cost that leaving out the wrath of God against sin uh, has left us with. For many people in the world today and even in the church, for all intents and purposes, salvation for many of us has just become meaningless. H. Richard Niebuhr, a great um, theologian, Reformed theologian of the, the last century, wrote a book uh, I believe it was in 1937, uh, it, was, it was called The Kingdom of God in America, in which he describes the thin soup that even then had come to pass as the gospel. He says, uh, he describes the gospel as it was understood then, as a God without wrath brought people without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of Christ without a cross. You, know, you read a text like that, and that really does. This was written in 1937. This describes a theology for a lot of people, uh, even in the church today. A God without wrath, bringing people without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of Christ without a cross. Uh, and you know what? When, when this becomes uh, our uh, practical theology, it is no wonder that people don't go to church anymore. Why? We don't need to be saved because there's nothing to be saved from. There's no such thing as sin. There's no such thing as judgment. There's, you know, and, and on and on it goes. Now, I, I just want to uh, now pause here and shift gears and maybe even change direction a little bit. You remember last week um, I was talking about uh, how um, there was a problem with the way I had said something. There's a problem with the way I'm saying this today. I just want to stop and acknowledge the problem. What I had said was, uh, I drew the analogy, you may remember, asking somebody why they garden. And it would be really weird if somebody said, well, the reason I garden is because I hate weeds so much. Now, the reason we garden is there's a positive reason that people garden. It's because they love uh, beautiful flowers and 
delicious fruits and vegetables, and that's why you garden. Um, you know, the point and purpose of, of Scripture uh, isn't that we focus on uh, judgment and the wrath of, of God. We have to take it seriously, but that's not the focus. Focusing on God's right to judge evil, we can't put the emphasis on the wrong syllable here. Nam 1.7 says, the Lord is good. The Lord's good. A refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. And here's the right way to say it. God's ultimate desire is that we be saved. That's God's ultimate desire. God wants you to be saved from something real. From judgment. How does that happen? Well, the answer uh, goes beyond the book of Nam. The answer is that God's judgment and God's mercy come perfectly together in Jesus' death on the cross. Because when Jesus died on the cross, we see in that that sin is taken seriously. God's judgment against sin is declared. A sentence against sin is passed, and the penalty for sin is paid. Jesus goes to the cross voluntarily taking the place of anyone who is willing to admit their sin, to ask for forgiveness, and to trust themselves to God's grace. I mentioned earlier that Nam was the prophet that Jonah wished that he could have been thing is, the people of Nineveh were saved for a season because they heard the word of the Lord and repented. The question is this, uh, what is repentance? And is, is it just this little short-term thing like it seems to have been for the people of Nineveh? What is repentance and why is it so important? You know, last week I really wasn't thinking how fast I was driving until I saw this police car parked in the shade by the side of the road. And the minute I saw that police officer, I looked at my speedometer and I realized I was guilty of breaking the law. There I said it. Your pastor was guilty of breaking the law. The law. And if, if that police officer had pulled me over and not the guy in front of me, there would have been a price to pay. And that price would have been fully justified. And I would have no one to blame except myself. It wasn't the police officer's fault. It wasn't the guy in front of me's fault. I was the guy who was breaking the law. And then I remembered something that I had learned in traffic school. And here's what I learned. And this was, police officer told me this. And by the way, we have a number of folks in our church family who are part of the law enforcement community, and they say this doesn't work every time. <laughs> I'm just talking about how to minimize here. This guy said, if you're speeding down the road and you spot a police car, put your foot on the brake. Now, this does three things. This accomplishes three things. Number one, it will cause your vehicle to decelerate. Number two, it will turn a light on in the rear of your car. Two of them, actually. The brake lights will come on. And number three, if the police officer uh, sees it, um, he will have something to respond to other than just your speeding. He can make a judgment call. Now, you might think that to put your foot on the brake is just asking for trouble, that it is an admission of guilt. 
And in a sense, it is an admission of guilt. But let me tell you something else it does. It also shows respect for the law and demonstrates an honest effort to honor it. Don't get this illustration wrong. You know, so it, let, let me just say, I stepped on the brake, just like that guy said, and guess what happened? I had a religious experience. <laughs> I got to experience grace. I got to experience grace. Guilty, but in a sense, the sin was overlooked. Police car passed me and pulled the guy over who just kept racing on ahead. By the way, I've had other experiences of this in, in other contexts. Um, a former um, pastor of this church who will remain uh, unnamed, he and I were uh, jaywalking or attempting to jaywalk uh, across uh, Colorado in Pasadena one afternoon while we were uh, there for a conference at, at Fuller Seminary. And, and you know how sometimes you're in, a, uh, in the middle of a city block and you don't want to go to either end across the street at the crosswalks and all this kind of stuff. And we didn't see any traffic or whatever, so we just decided, you know, to, to do it. So we, we started walking out into the street. We'd taken about two steps and around the corner pulls a police car. And I think to myself, mm, this is probably not a good idea. So I just went like this. <laughs> My friend saw the police car as well, and he just decided, I don't know, well, this is an integrity issue for me. I started, I'm just going to keep going. I don't know what, what he was thinking. But he kept going. And guess what? The police officer gave him a ticket and not me. And, and he said, why didn't you give him a ticket? Said, nice, <laughs> throw me under the bus. <laughs> and he said, because when he saw me, he turned around. One of the things that's really interesting is that in, uh, in both the Hebrew language and the Greek language, in Hebrew, there's a word shuv, and in, um, in Greek, there's this word metanoia, and both of them mean exactly the same thing. Both of them are translated uh, repent uh, or repentance in English, and both of them mean to turn around. This is what repentance is. This is the role of the law in the Old Testament, in, in the New Testament, in Scripture. Paul talks about what's the purpose of the law? Is the, the law going to make us righteous? No, but it will uh, make us aware of our unrighteousness so that we will turn around and turn toward God. That's what repentance is. When we re And write this down. This is just a really great rule of thumb. When you realize you're doing something wrong, your best course of action is to stop doing it. This is one of the reasons why, folks, if you want to grow spiritually, read the Bible. Because when you read the Bible, it will tell you about two things, and it will ratchet them up to, to their full extent. It will tell you uh, about the righteousness of God and remind us, reminds us of the ways in which we, we depart from that, and will also remind us of the, the even greater grace of God by, by which, by means of which we are saved. Um, now, I know this, this story about me, you know, escaping a, a justifiable speeding ticket is not a great analogy, and I'll tell you uh, why it's not a great analogy, because, and I don't want you to get the right, or the wrong idea, I'm not telling you this story to teach you how to speed and get away with it, because really the purpose of this is that we don't speed. And if all we're doing is just breaking the law but figuring out what slick ways to av avoid it or whatever, it, does that create any kind of sense of righteousness or whatever? See, this is the work of the Holy Spirit in us that, um, you know, the law reminds us of our unrighteousness, but the Holy Spirit actually gives us the power to do something about it by changing our hearts. And by the way, this is one big difference between uh, what Dietrich Bonhoeffer, great great uh, German theologian of the last century put to death by Adolf Hitler about one week before the end of the Second World War. 
Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, wrote about the difference between costly grace and cheap grace, and that's a huge difference because costly grace is the gift of a righteous God who has every right to judge wickedness in the world and in us because it mars his creation and it hurts and harms his children. Big difference between the costly grace that's a gift of a righteous God who loves the world so much that he sent his one and only son because sin does have to be atoned for. A price does have to be paid for it. Or else God is not a holy God and a righteous God. It's a difference between that kind of costly grace which cost uh, Jesus' death on the cross and the cheap grace, this thin soup that Niebuhr was you know, kind of talking about, in which we find this sort of casual, cooked up, short-lived comfort by telling ourselves, uh, as someone did, I don't remember who, whose quote this is, that of course God will forgive me, that is his business. And this is why Jesus and the cross matter so much. God's justice and his mercy meet in Jesus on the cross. Sin is taken seriously, yet forgiveness is offered freely to anyone who is willing to admit their sin and to turn from it and to trust themselves to God through him. And this is why we can live despite our brokenness, despite the fact that I speed when I shouldn't. That we can live in freedom and grace and gratitude with a sense of hope, knowing that God has made provision for us through Jesus Christ, who is our hope. Let's pray together.